All right, so today's session is going to be about working with VX Grid APIs. Um, I'll, before we start, a little bit about myself. Um, I'm uh, in what uh, I'm senior technical leader in advanced service, what used to be advanced services, now we call it professional services. I'm based out of uh, New Jersey. I've been with Cisco for almost 11 years at this point. Um, I specialize in uh, ISA, say AnyConnect, among other products. And uh, recently, I've been doing a lot of work in uh, the cloud area. All right, uh, to, this is the, what we're going to go through today. Um, uh, I want to give a forewarning that this session is is about coding. Uh, it's not your traditional uh, ICE webinar, but where we configure things. Uh, this this is going to be a little bit of a deep dive into in, uh, interfacing with ICE programmatically. All right, let's get started. Um, a PS grid is used for uh, for a few common use cases. Um, uh, many of you have seen this slide. ICE has uh, uh, a rich amount of information available to it from endpoints, from users, from external identity stores, from vulnerability scanners, from directory, from uh, a bunch of other things. And uh, with PX Grid, we are able to share this information with um, uh, either other Cisco products or third-party products, or if you uh, view the session, you will learn how to even develop your own code to do, to do that. Uh, another common use case for uh, PX Grid is Adaptive Network Controller, or ANC. Uh, it uh, is also called Rapid Threat contain Containment, where uh, external products, such as uh, StealthWatch, or today it's called Sec Secure Network Analytics, or uh, another, another uh, product that supports this uh, type of integration is Forescout. They can send a, an action to ICE to quarantine an endpoint if they detect malicious activity coming out of that endpoint. That's another common use case. And uh, final use case that I'll cover here is called context in. This allows uh, uh, vendors that profile uh, IoT devices, uh, such as Order, Armis, Nozomi, to send information about IoT devices they find on the network to ICE so that ICE can make intelligent authorization decisions based on that information. Uh, we will see in this slide, uh, there are hundreds of integrations available for PX Grid uh, from third parties and our own Cisco products. All right, let's quickly jump into uh, architecture of PX Grid. Uh, these are the three supported deployment models for ICE. We have small deployment with just two nodes. We have medium deployment with up to eight nodes. And uh, we have the fully distributed deployment with up to 50 PSNs. Uh, in each deployment, uh, we have we can support up to a certain number of PX grid nodes. They're highlighted in blue here. And one important thing about PX grid node, PX grid version 2.0, which we cover here, is that all the nodes are active. If you ever do, uh, I've seen confusion from some customers when they execute show um, uh, application status ice in CLI, it shows that PX grid services is standby. That refers to the previous version of PX grid. With PX grid version two, all PX grid nodes are active and uh, can serve equal uh, amount of services. Um, the XGrid uh, 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 framework is uh, generally split into these three categories. PXGrid controller is your uh, uh, PXGrid node in your deployment. PXGrid publisher is the node that sends data into the PXGrid controller. And PXGrid subscriber is what receives that data. ICE nodes could be. Uh, could play either of the roles. We'll, we'll, we'll look over some examples on how um, that works in the future slides. But ICE nodes can be publishers, can be subscribers. Uh, this shows the version support for um, PSGrid API versions. Um, uh, 
we do recommend that at this point everyone migrates over to version two of the API, which uh, uh, is the only version supported starting with ICE 3.1. Uh, let's talk about HA real quick. Uh, so since all PXRID nodes are active, PXRID clients are free to connect to multiple nodes. And this scenario that I'm showing here is what we recommend. We recommend that PXRID clients connect to two PXRID nodes uh, and receive the, it, and PXRID client will receive the same data from both nodes and the client is responsible for deduping it so that uh, the data received by the backup node is simply deleted. If the primary node fails, the PXRID client can start, can start processing data from the second node. Another common configuration is active passive. So PXRID client can connect to just one PXRID node and receive the data. And then if that connection fails, uh, PXRID client has to execute a bulk download to download all the data that, um, in this case, session data from the MNT, and then they can start uh, receiving um, all the additional incoming data. This obviously will not fail over as quickly as the previous setup, but uh, it, it's going to be easier to code. Okay, PXRID APIs. Uh, I want to highlight this URL and you will see this URL in the references further down. Uh, this is the uh, the main, the, this is the authoritative source for all of the PXRID APIs and what uh, they support and uh, the format of those APIs. There are two ways to interface with PXRID. The first one is uh, simple REST API calls. They run over 10 and REST API calls um, are just as simple as ERS API calls. They're, they're just single operations that you can execute to retrieve or post data into ICE. Um, one important uh, in, highlight here is that when you use REST API, PXRead nodes only use as a broker of the connection. You will actual the, your actual rest api calls will go directly to the nodes that make the data available for example admin and mnt nodes and there will be examples uh, how that works web sockets is uh, another way to interface with px grid and unlike rest api calls web sockets establish a persistent connection to receive real time information from ice uh, web sockets use a protocol called stump and uh, what's important here is that WebSocket connections will always be to the PXRead nodes. So if you need to receive session data, your WebSocket connection will be to the PXRead nodes. You will not uh, establish WebSocket connections to the MNT node. Uh, in all the examples, this is the topology that was used. So you can see the, the names of the nodes is pretty self-explanatory. We have two admin nodes, two MNT nodes, two PXRID nodes, and two PSNs. There are two ways to authenticate with PXRID. So before you can communicate with ICE via PXRID, you need to authenticate. So the most common way to authenticate with PXRID is uh, certificates. And I know this is uh, the fear of all administrators to set up PX grid certificates. Uh, I'll just cover the important parts here is that since admin and MIT nodes uh, can be connected to directly using REST API, they need the PX grid certificates as well. It's not just the PX grid nodes that need PX grid certificates. All of the nodes in the deployment need PX grid certificates because the client could connect to uh, any of them, but especially admin and MNT. Uh, it's easiest to have certificates from corporate CA. We do have many examples using internal CA, but it's easier to have them from corporate CA. Um, uh, certificates, since the since the PXRID service can be can subscribe or publish information, they need to uh, have both server and client authentication um, EKUs enabled on them. Uh, some uh, 
important things about uh, some more important things about certificates. Uh, when we use password authentication, client certificates are not needed. ICE does not care about the FQDN of the client certificate. So ICE uh, simply validates that the certificate is trusted and it doesn't validate FQDN. So that, that's an important uh, point. In fact, it does, you can, if you want to test something out and you don't have time to generate a certificate, you can simply take the, the PX certificate from ICE and install it on the client and that will work as well. That will also work just as fine. Uh, just like with EPTLS authentication, uh, the uh, certificate validation is uh, is asynchronous. So your client certificates and the and the PX certificates don't need to be issued by the same CA. Uh, this shows an example uh, uh, on the left. Here is the, the PX certificate that we'll be using throughout this document. We can see that the PX certificate is trusted by ICE. On the client side, uh, the client can choose to trust the CA certificate from PXRID node or, or ignore it. So it's up to you as a, as a developer of the product. You can choose to ignore ICE certificate or you can choose to trust it. But ICE must trust the client certificate or the connection will not work. Uh, before you can communicate with uh, ICE says PX client, your account has to be approved. Uh, ICE does support auto approvals, uh, which is not enabled by default, but if you tick this option, it uh, as soon as you try to authenticate to PX with a valid certificate, you with a valid certificate, you will be able to communicate. So how do we authenticate the certificate? We execute two API calls, account activate and, and then uh, all, ICE administrator can hit approve, or you can do you can have auto approval enabled, and even um, there are API calls available to approve clients. So before we jump into examples, uh, which uh, we'll have a lot of, I want to show um, the differences between the curl examples which you will see in this document and re and Python examples. We ultimately execute the same calls. So I'm going to just highlight that the information that we pass to curl is the same information that we pass to the request function, request module in Python. So we have the username and password, we have our URL, we have the CA certificate that validates the trust of the I certificate, uh, our certificate, uh, our client certificate and the, and the client uh, private key file. And finally, the data that we're going to post in our request. One important thing I want to say here is that the the slides uh, wh I wanted to make the slides readable. So the code on the slides is the bare minimum that is needed for the code to run. They don't have a lot of error handling. They don't have a lot of other checks. Uh, but the GitHub uh, repositories that you will see further in the references contains uh, more complete examples. All right, so now we can jump into authentication with certificates. So here we are authenticating with a client certificate, and you can see that we are supplying the client certificate and the private key for that certificate. Uh, the name, the user, this is the the username that we are supplying to PXGrid is going to end up being the client that you see in the GUI of ICE. When we use certificates, password can be anything. I specify none here, you can specify any value. ICE does not check. Once the administrator approves the account, this account activate API will return enabled. Uh, if auto approval is enabled, as soon as we execute the account activate, uh, API call, the client becomes enabled immediately, so we don't have to wait for administrator to approve it. This is a Python example, same thing, we're executing account activate. Our best practice calls for the client to retry every 60 seconds, so the client can continue executing account activate uh, every 60 seconds until the administrator approves the account. 
now so that now we, we're going to look at password authentication so with password authentication we have an additional api call called account create and what account create does it tells us to generate a password for you you don't get to specify the password for for authentication ice will generate that password for you um, to password authentication is not enabled by, by default so you have to enable it uh, this is an example call to px grid we can see that we're not specifying a user and password we are calling account create and in our post we're specifying what our client name is going to be and i will generate this password for us it's important to know that this password cannot be retrieved again you have to save it in your code and uh, when you look in the GUI of ice you will see this client in initialized state next using that username and password that ice generated you again call our uh, the same account activate the that will put the client into pending state now unlike with the certificate authentication you cannot enable auto approval the when you use password authentication the client has to be approved either by administrator or an api call this is a python example so it's a similar thing we create we create our account we retrieve the password for that account we call account activate and uh, again i'm highlighting here that you must as a as a developer uh, of this client you must save this password somewhere in your configuration locally i can, will not you will not be able to retrieve this client again password again all right now that we went through authentication let's look at uh, how to interface uh, using rest api um, what I'm going to cover in this section are a few example API calls and uh, what information from the uh, Git this reference page you will use to uh, execute those calls. So the information that's important here is, is the service name. So in this case, we'll be going through example for TrustSec service and we're going to execute uh, this API call. So what you need to know, you don't need to know the URL for, for this service, all you need to know is the service name and the name of the API call. You don't need to know any other URLs. So how does this work? First thing you execute a service lookup and you supply that uh, uh, service name. Then you execute access secret, which returns a special secret that is is maintained by ICE for authentication to specific ICE nodes. This is different than the client secret that we just talked about in the previous section. This this node secret um, uh, can be rotated by ICE. So whenever you use REST API calls or any other calls with PX, be sure to execute uh, access secret. And then once we have this access secret, we, ex we execute our API call. So let's look at the example. So this is a uh, first we call service lookup. As you can see, the only thing I'm supplying here is the name of that service. And in the result, we can see what node will be providing that service. If you recall in the beginning of the session, I said the data is provided directly by the node. So in this case, TrustSec data is provided by the admin node. And this is the URL for this admin node. Okay, we don't need to remember any of these URLs. Next, we do access secret and we specify the node name that uh, we need the secret for, and we get that secret here. And finally, we execute our uh, API call, get security groups. So uh, we are supplying the, the node secret from the previous slide as a, as a password. Our client name is uh, the same client name as we, we created, so that's important. And then the base URL, remember, we don't need to uh, generate this base URL manually. All we're doing is taking it from the output of the previous call. And finally, we specify our API call and we receive the data. 
All right, so this is the Python example for the same thing. We're, we're doing service lookup. We're grabbing the node name and the URL name from the result. We're doing access secret. We're uh, grabbing that access secret here. And we are executing our API call. I will mention that uh, in the GitHub page, there is a file that contains all of these uh, uh, commands and the, with the outputs here to keep it short, uh, I didn't include the outputs from Python. Okay, now we will look at another example. Uh, we're going to do a, a quarantine action that we talked about before. So here we're looking up uh, service ANC. And in this case, ANC is handled by the MNT node. As, uh, the one thing I'll mention here is that ICE will return these nodes in random order, so you have some level of, actually no, so for this one, it will return the second node. Uh, uh, again, and it, the process is the same. We get the node name and we get the uh, URL. We do the same thing. We get our secret and we execute the API call. Now, what's important here is that we need to format our post according to the API call. So you, if you look at our API details, we can see that uh, this particular API call is expecting a policy object, and a policy object has a value, of, uh, has an attribute of name, which is a string, and actions, which is an array. Uh, uh, so array is uh, a Java, name for a list for those who are not familiar. Uh, same example in Python, again, uh, service lookup, uh, all of the rest of this code is, is pretty much the same. Uh, and then we execute our post to create the policy called block. Uh, here's how we can actually use this policy to apply to the endpoint. Again, referencing uh, our API, we can see that this API call takes a policy name and a MAC address. And uh, there we go. We have policy name, we have the MAC address, and uh, we get a result uh, of a successful ANC policy. Uh, Python example, I didn't include the entire example here, but uh, the rest of the code is exactly the same. Uh, the only difference is that we are just executing a different API call, supplying our JSON blob here to blo to apply the NC policy. All right, now we move on to WebSocket. So unlike REST API calls, WebSockets establish persistent connection. And the advantage of WebSocket is that you receive data in real time. The client doesn't need to poll and poll and poll for information. This is especially useful for session data, uh, which ICE will generate a lot of in a large deployment. Uh, so uh, uh, it will be a lot more efficient than retrieving the session data uh, using polling. Um, WebSocket runs over the same port. Uh, that's an important distinction between WebSocket and, uh, and other protocols, is that the client will initially connect with a regular HTTP protocol and then send an upgrade request to upgrade connection to WebSocket. So it, it stays over the same 8910 TCP port. Okay. Uh, WebSocket is is a, is a base protocol that's used to exchange data with an HTTP server. For ICE, uh, we use Stomp protocol uh, to communicate with ICE or WebSockets. And uh, this, is an, this, the, this protocol is well-defined. And uh, what I want to just show here is, that is, is an example Stomp frame. So the Stomp frame uh, has a command, it has some header values, and it has a body. Uh, and ICE expects the the stump frame to be null ended. So when you supply the stump command to ICE, or, or or and when you receive the data from ICE, the frame has to be null terminated. 
Uh, Stump protocol supports text frames. As soon as you send a text frame without an all, it will uh, ice will will uh, reset your connection. So that's important. Ice. Uh, this is a link where Stump protocol is described uh, in reference to ice. Ice supports these uh, options. In this presentation, we'll look at connect, subscribe, and send API calls or Stump messages. Uh, in this example, curl uh, does not support uh, web sockets. So what I'm doing, I'm, what I'm doing, what I'm using is this other utility that enables us to send uh, web socket API calls from command lines without writing code. Uh, if you're comfortable with Python, you don't you don't really need this. But if you just want to experiment with the XGrid without writing code, you can use this utility. Uh, I included some example uh, commands here: how to generate a message. Uh, and what I want to highlight here is this utility specifically. If you send binary message and our binary messages uh, and our messages are binary because they end in a null, you have to convert them to a base64. So base64 has nothing to do with web sockets. It just has to do with this utility if you want to use it. So what do we do with uh, this is our flow to interface with web sockets. We do a service lookup for a service like TrustSec, uh, sessions, to retrieve the list of topics that that service will support. And topics is what the clients will subscribe to. We then need to do a service lookup to find out the node that's responsible for publishing and subscribing to those topics. So we do two service lookup. Uh, we do our access secret again for this pub sub node. And then we establish our WebSocket connection. We send the stump connect frame to connect to the pub sub service. And then we subscribe. So this is when we use subscribe method for uh, the XGrid. Let's look at the example. Uh, service lookup, you're, we already, we've seen this in the previous slides. We do a lookup for session. And inside of the response, uh, we can see what topics session service supports. So in this case, uh, the most common one obviously is uh, session topic. Uh, and we get the uh, pub sub service for this topic, for this, for this service. And then we do a lookup for pub sub that is taken from the previous slide, I mean from the previous call. And when we do a lookup for pub sub, you can see the node name we get in the response is pxgrid. So the session data when received by WebSockets is, is uh, always targeted at the pxgrid nodes. And here we have our uh, WebSocket URL that will access to retrieve the data. Now here, this list is definitely random randomized. So when you try to connect to pxgrid as a client, Sometimes ICE will send you to the first to one node. Sometimes we'll send you to another node. So it's done for, to support some level of load balancing. So our recommendation is to simply pick the first on the list. Uh, we access the node secret for our pub sub node from the previous call. And we subscribe. So I have some base 64 examples here, uh, but uh, here is essentially what we are sending twice so we are first sending a connect call which uh, contains what version we support and it's, it, and we say which pub sub node we are connecting to from the previous slide we get a response from ice that we are connected to that node and then finally we and once we receive connected we can send the subscribe stump command that we're subscribing to the topic. Remember, this is from the return of the session lookup for, uh, for I session. And we are required to specify this ID. This, this just specifies the unique ID for your client. When a new session comes online, since you're subscribed to the session topic, we receive a message from um, from PXGrid, and this is the contents of that message when we decode it, because we're using WebSocket, 
the, that utility. Uh, and uh, I beautified this uh, output here and you can see the information that we receive over that subscription to the session topic. We got our username, we got the MAC address of the client, we have the cold station ID, IP addresses that the client has, and uh, what state they're in. I show authenticated, and then uh, if familiar with ICE, it, it, it'll go from authenticated to started. So you will actually get two of these uh, messages uh, as the session transitions from authenticated to started, and then to disconnected ultimately. A uh, Python example, um, I'm using WebSocket library. This is a different library that you'll find in a lot of examples. Um, uh, it's uh, simpler to use than what's posted in a lot of examples. So I'm using it. So, uh, so first we are doing a lookup for uh, session. We get what topics we support and we're, we're interested in the session topic. We select our pub sub service. We we do our lookup for pub sub service here. We get our WebSocket URL, and then we do an access secret for this node. So up to now, these are just regular REST API calls to uh, to to retrieve this information. And this is where we uh, execute our WebSocket commands. So since we are uh, running in sort of asynchronous mode, we need to have the WebSocket just listen for new messages. We have to use callbacks. Uh, so in this case, we are connecting to the WebSocket URL and we have two callbacks. On open callback, we'll uh, execute when the WebSocket connection is established and on message will execute when a new message is received over that WebSocket connection. So as you can see, when the connection is open, we are going to send our connect command and subscribe command. What's important here uh, is that we need to specify that we're sending binary commands. Otherwise, the WebSocket, this WebSocket library will send the command in, in plain text, which ICE node will reject. And then we just run forever. So basically this will establish the WebSocket and then wait for messages. And then this, this is the example of the output from that Python script. We can see that uh, we received our connected message from ICE and we received our message once when the user connected to the network. Context in, this is the IoT example that we talked about in the beginning. Um, context in uses a probe in ICE called PXGrid probe. So when the data posted into ICE via PXGrid, you do need to have a couple of PSNs configured with PXGrid probe so that it can retrieve that data from the PXGrid channel, I guess. So uh, the flow here is you do service register uh, according to the manual, uh, in my tests, this service register doesn't seem to be needed, but um, it's in the manual, so I'm listing it here. Uh, I want to highlight that these calls are exactly the same as before. So we do a lookup for pop sub, access secret, establish WebSocket connection, and then we send our connect command. And then the difference is we, instead of doing uh, subscribe, we're doing a send. So in this example, we are going to post this data, uh, which is, a, this, this particular example is available in the GitHub page that we'll show later um, in a JSON file. Uh, the contents of this file is, is documented in the same web page. Um, you can see there are a bunch of attributes you can set that can later be used in the profiling policies. We do our service register. Um, and um, according to the manual, I'll just mention that we are supposed to re-register every five minutes here, um, but uh, this call doesn't seem to be required. We do service lookup, pops up. We get our PXGrid node. This, this is the same call as previously. 
we access our secret and we send our command we send connect we get the connected response and then we execute the send command the send command has a destination topic of endpoint asset we need to specify the content length in the header and then you notice there is a new line because that's a stump frame and then the contents of our json um, this entire json needs to be squeezed into one line so just uh, that's important you cannot submit it in multiple lines this whole json has to be combined into a single line and today uh, when you send this frame there is no feedback from ice so it uh, you sort of sending in a in a black hole there is no feedback that ice received this frame uh, uh, i won't go through uh through every detail in this command basically what it does it, it takes this endpoint.json file uh strips out the new line characters and and, and shortens it so that you can send it using webs so cat if, uh, if you want to give it a try uh, so this this file basically takes this endpoint.json and generates this text blob for you uh, now that the data is posted it it's retrieved by that psn node where we had pxgrid probe enabled and in this case this psn node becomes a subscriber to the asset topic so when our application posts to subscribe to asset topic this psn retrieves it and you can see you can compare the data between our json and what's in the context visibility you can see that it's the same um, information um, this is context in a using python uh, again this code is the uh, same we do service register service lookup access secret um, and in this case we don't use callbacks because in our particular example we don't care to keep the web socket open all the time uh, we are just connecting to the web socket using the open com uh, sorry uh, yeah we create our web socket connection we read in our uh, json file and uh, we send the connect command send command and then we just disconnect so for our particular example we just do it all in one shot and we don't need to use callbacks to handle it one thing uh, that i want to highlight here is that this websocket library does not support as an option to specify username and password so we have to manually generate the authorization header so this is a common way to generate it header encode decode um, that that's because this code has to be converted from unicode to plain text so that's why you need encode decode to get this working note secret here of course is the um, access secret result uh, that's all i uh, wanted to cover for api calls so now uh, the last thing i want to cover here is this utility that's available um, for anyone this utility would run on 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 um, on your client not on the ice node so uh, it's fully it, it will all of it, this utilities functions will work on mac os and linux <clears throat> i last time i tested uh, web sockets didn't seem to work on windows so just keep that in mind uh, this utility will support certificate and password authentication uh, it supports i want to say all but uh, i know i coded it to support most of the services um, for uh, that px supports uh, we can do subscri subscribing context in that's all supported if you want to see internals of all the api calls that are going to ice you can type debug command and it'll show you great details about the api calls 
uh, how to install this, uh, you clone um, the repo, you install the requirements, the, basically the, the, the same thing you would do for any Python utility. You install the requirements and then you execute uh, the command and you get a, an interactive shell. And then from this interactive shell, you can do help. Uh, you can see all of the services that it supports. Uh, if you recall, we had account create, activate, trust sec, uh, what else we looked at, session. Uh, you can, if you want to execute, uh, if you want to see what these options support, you can do help and then that particular option, in this case, it's a, uh, uh, options that SXP session supports, SXP service supports. Uh, you can configure it interactively. So you can use config command to specify the directory node. Uh, you specify the name of your client. You specify your client certificate and key. You specify the root. You execute config.apply that, that activates this configuration. And then you can start executing API calls. In this case, we are executing account activate call. We can see the account is activated. And then uh, once the account is activated, you can basically execute um, all your standard uh, API calls, uh, the execute calls. So in this particular case, I'm executing uh, an a, a REST API call to retrieve all sessions. I just type simply type session all and it will give you a dump of all the sessions. Obviously, if you're executing this against a busy environment, the output of this will just keep on scrolling and scrolling and scrolling. Uh, so just be aware of that. Uh, there is a way to filter it. So if you do help session, you can filter it on a specific IP address or a specific MAC address. Uh, in this example, we are creating a policy, an ANC policy called stop. And if you recall, we had exact same parameters uh, using, AP, uh, using REST API calls. So when you call this API call, ICE responds that the API call, uh, that the ANC policy was created. Here's another example of getting system performance statistics, which is also available by IPX grid. And uh, this example shows that you can subscribe to topics. So in this case, we are, we are listing which topics are available first. So session topics, it shows that session supports these two topics. And then we are subscribing to the session topic and it will stay on this. It will stay connected until you press control C here. And this shows an example that uh, it, re it received a message um, that a new session came online. Um, some quick references here. Uh, we have uh, uh, documentation from developer.cisco.com, uh, the full PXDRID reference that I showed screenshots from. Uh, uh, this. This is probably the best place to go to get details on every API call. Um, this is where you can download that uh, CLI utility. And uh, this is where all of the examples from this deck are. And uh, there is a file there that contains all of the curl commands and Python scripts that were executed. Uh, as you can see here, the session was originally, I originally went to present this at uh, Cisco Live. I couldn't make it to Cisco Live this year, but this session will, if anyone's going to Cisco Live, this session will be uh, presented by a colleague of ours. Uh, it's DevNet 2132, it was renamed, it was renumbered. It's 9 a.m. on Monday. And with that, I, We'll show this slide with all of the other references and all the ICE resources. And that's all.